Myocardial infarction, a life-threatening clinical manifestation of a series of inflammatory changes in the walls of the coronary arteries. It is a leading cause of death in the Western world. Can periodontitis or other inflammatory processes of the oral cavity contribute to the development of cardiovascular diseases and systemic conditions such as atherosclerosis or diabetes or negatively influence their course? Periodontitis, the presence of a bacterial biofilm on the root surface, triggers an immune inflammatory response. Inflammatory cells infiltrate the connective tissue and the pocket epithelium becomes ulcerated. The total wound area of connective tissue exposed to the subgingival biofilm can range from 5 square centimeters to 20 square centimeters, an area the size of the palm of the hand. Periodontal bacteria from the biofilm will repeatedly enter the blood vessels of the gingiva, for example when eating or brushing, due to this exposed connective tissue. Similarly, locally produced inflammatory mediators will shed into the bloodstream. From the local vessels, bacteria and inflammatory mediators will spread through the entire body threatening the integrity of the vital internal organs and structures of the body. Periodontitis, therefore, is not just a local issue, but may have systemic effects even at distant locations away from the oral cavity. Some bacteria, such as Porphyromonas gingivalis, have special structures on their surfaces, the so-called fimbriae. These fimbriae allow them to attach and penetrate the layer of endothelial cells lining the blood vessels. Well hidden from the immune system, the bacteria survive, persist, and multiply within the cells and infect other endothelial cells. Receptors such as TLR2 and TLR4 detect the bacteria. This results in activation of the endothelial cells with secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines such as monocyte chemotactic protein 1. In addition, vascular cell adhesion molecules and other cell adhesion proteins are expressed on their surface. This attracts monocytes, which then bind to the endothelial cells. Furthermore, signal cascades are induced inside the cell, ultimately leading to apoptosis in some of the infected endothelial cells. This is the early stage of atherosclerosis, endothelial dysfunction. Blood vessels begin to lose their elasticity. The next step in atherogenesis is the formation of so-called fatty streaks. Monocytes migrate into the vascular wall, differentiate into macrophages, and take up oxidized LDL cholesterol and turn into foam cells. Periodontal bacteria like P. gingivalis may promote the formation of fatty streaks by increasing monocyte migration, the oxidation of LDL, 
and the uptake of oxidized LDL by macrophages. The foam cells gradually become apoptotic, forming a necrotic core within the atherosclerotic plaque. Muscle cells of the lamina media proliferate and migrate into the intima, as well as T lymphocytes and other immune cells. This eventually leads to the formation of a mature atheroma that reduces the cross-section of the vessel, causing hypoperfusion and hypoxia of the tissues that the vessel serves, for example the heart, if the coronary arteries are affected. Possible future complications can be actively exacerbated by the unique properties of periodontal pathogens, which promote the formation of matrix metalloproteinases by T lymphocytes and other cell types. These proteinases gradually degrade the connective tissue so that the atherosclerotic plaque is ultimately broken up. Platelets rapidly attach to the rupture sites, they mature and coagulate to form a thrombus. This further narrows the already reduced blood vessel lumen and may even lead to complete vascular occlusion. Clinical events, such as a myocardial infarction or a stroke, may occur as a result. The cytokines secreted by the dysfunctional endothelial cells act not only locally, but spread through the bloodstream to all other parts of the body. The bacteria in the blood and their lipopolysaccharides induce the formation of acute phase proteins, such as C-reactive protein or CRP in the liver. The messenger substances in turn cause a systemic inflammation that can promote all stages of atherogenesis. The systemic inflammation triggered by periodontitis can also affect the regulation of blood sugar. Normally, membrane-bound insulin receptors register the presence of insulin in the blood. insulin binds to these receptors, a signaling cascade is initiated inside the cell, which ultimately activates glucose transporters. This allows the glucose that enters the bloodstream following a meal to enter the cell, where it is processed for energy or storage. In the presence of systemic inflammation, Inflammatory mediators, oxygen radicals, and acute phase proteins interfere with this control mechanism. They inhibit the insulin receptors and reduce the uptake of glucose into the cell. Cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6, whose serum levels are significantly increased in periodontal infections, seem to play a special role here. The acute phase protein CRP induced by these mediators also appears to be of importance. In the presence of severe periodontitis, blood sugar levels can deteriorate over the years in a clinically significant manner, even without diabetes. There is a risk of developing a so-called insulin resistance. If diabetes is already present, 
The simultaneous presence of untreated severe periodontal disease makes proper glycemic control more challenging and increases the risk for complications of diabetes that affect the kidneys and heart many times over. Conversely, some disease mechanisms of diabetes can contribute to the deterioration of the patient's periodontal status. In particular, the Maillard reaction is relevant here. This reaction describes the non-enzymatic binding of sugar to protein molecules. For example, glucose in the blood binds to the hemoglobin of the erythrocytes. The percentage of glycated hemoglobin A1c, known as HB1c, is an important diagnostic and monitoring tool in diabetes, reflecting the patient's blood sugar control over time. However, with persistent hyperglycemia, even other proteins are glycated and eventually converted to so-called advanced glycation end products, or AGEs. AGEs are irreversible and mediate pathophysiological mechanisms which promote, in various ways, the development and progression of periodontal disease in diabetes. For example, AGEs cross-link the collagen strands of connective tissue. The resulting thickening of the basal membranes and the inhibited degradation of extracellular matrix interfere with the physiological tissue repair and wound healing processes, including in the periodontium. Furthermore, AGEs are recognized by a signaling receptor correspondingly named RAGE. This receptor is present on many cells of the human organism, including monocytes and endothelial cells. When AGEs bind to RAGE, one of the results is the production of reactive oxygen species and of pro-inflammatory mediators. These reactive oxygen species and cytokines promote periodontal inflammation and ultimately exacerbate periodontal tissue destruction through an exaggerated inflammatory response and limited tissue repair. There is a body of compelling evidence showing that periodontal inflammation is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. In the case of diabetes, the evidence supports a bidirectional connection with feedback effects. The successful treatment of periodontitis may therefore contribute to improved health not only in the oral cavity, but throughout the body. For example, some studies have shown that the extent of endothelial dysfunction, which is the initial step in atherogenesis, can be positively influenced in a clinically measurable way. Many studies have also shown an improvement in average blood glucose levels with lowered HbA1c values following successful periodontal therapy, and some even suggest improvements in lipid profiles, overall improving the control of diabetes. The two effects have in common that they reduce the concentration of inflammatory mediators in the blood. This is an important step in breaking the self-perpetuating cycle of inflammation in the body. <laughs>